faithfully serving him. If you have a Bible today, please join me in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 this morning. The Apostle Paul made three missionary journeys where he shared the gospel and he started churches all over the Mediterranean Rim. Half of our New Testament are letters to those churches. Paul's three journeys resulted in the writing of 13 letters. Those letters changed the world in spite of persecution. Uh, those letters, the truth in those letters, have brought you blessing and prosperity that you experience today. Christianity conquered the Roman, the pagan Roman Empire in less than 300 years. Now, Paul wrote three of those letters to pastors, and so they are called the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And they were written after Paul was released from prison, the first Roman imprisonment. And that's about, uh, they were written about 62 to 64 AD. It was right before Nero began his bloody persecution. And so the last stop on our journeys of Paul Bible study takes us to the island of Crete. Here, Paul is going to leave Titus, his spiritual son in the faith, and he's going to lead them there to help the many churches that have been started to grow in their faith. And oh, did they grow, as we will see today. Paul was on the island of Crete twice. The first time is when he was a prisoner on his way to Rome for trial. The book of Acts closes with this trip. We find the Apostle Paul imprisoned at Caesarea for two years. He said, I appeal to Caesar. And so Julius, a Roman centurion, is appointed to be able to escort and to take Paul as prisoner to Rome. So they board a ship and they sail up to Asia Minor. There at Myra, they board a second ship that's on its way to Rome. And they come down to Crete. And so they land at Fair Havens. They're there a few months and the centurion and the captain of the ship decide this is not a good place to winter in. Let's sail down the coast about 12 miles. The Apostle Paul says, uh, Men, I warn you, uh, if you do this, there's going to be great harm. They didn't listen to their pastor, so that's a good message for you. Listen to your pastor. And so they chose to sail a short 12-mile trip. The winds were calm, but as soon as they got out there, the storm Euryclidon blew in, and it blew the ship 600 miles to the west through a long storm, and they shipwrecked on Malta. So they lost the ship. Uh, they lost all the cargo just as Paul had predicted, but every soul was saved, and there on Malta, they boarded another ship, and they made their way to Rome. Through clues in First and Second Timothy and Titus, we can piece together a trail of the places that Paul visited after his release from prison. And this was a new and exciting discovery for me. I'm glad to share with you today. You can check it out at a website, thebiblejourney.com, to see this. You know, the more you study your Bible, the more you will discover. The more you study your Bible, the more you will grow in faith. And so whether you're a, a new Christian or a new Bible student, I suggest you begin in the New Testament. If you're a seasoned saint, I suggest you continue to be, make it a goal to be in your Bible every day. Is God wants to show you new things. And so this is what I've discovered, and I'm excited to, to share with you today. So the second time Paul went to Crete was after his release from the Roman prison, about 62 AD, and he went to minister to the many churches all over Crete. He traveled on to Miletus, uh, but he left uh, Titus there on Crete. The Bible says in Titus 1.5, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, that is, ordain pastors in every city as I had appointed thee. And so we know he went to Crete. Now we don't know the chronology of this trip, but we do know the places that he went to because of the clues that he left us. It makes sense that it's most likely he sailed north uh, to, North, to, to Asia Minor because we know that he visited Miletus. Again, Trophimus, have I left at Miletus sick? 
2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. So if you will turn to page 2 of your notes, an important note here is so you have him on Crete, he leaves Titus there. You have him in Miletus, he leaves Trophimus there. Now this is another evidence that the temporary sign gifts were passing out of use. They're called Holy Spirit gifts, temporary gifts that Jesus predicted they would have in Mark chapter 16. Paul healed many in his early ministry as the New Testament was being written. If I had the gift of healing, you'd find me down at CHOP, at Children's Hospital, going from room to room. I don't have that gift, neither do you, neither does anybody else today. But as predicted in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, the sign gifts, tongues and healing, will pass away. According to Jesus, their purpose of these sign gifts was temporary, and it was to be able to confirm the message and the messenger until the New Testament was written. How do we know this to be true? Paul had three co-workers in his later ministry that he did not heal. Now, Paul healed hundreds of people we know in Ephesus. We know he had the gift of healing, but Aphrodite in Philippians 2 was sick nigh unto death. Timothy was sick, 1 Timothy 5, 23. Trophimus have I left sick at Miletum. Paul, why didn't you heal him? Paul himself may have been sick and not healed, 2 Corinthians 12. Why didn't he heal them? Because the sign gifts were passing away. If sign gifts were in use today, then the charismatic missionaries would never have to go to language school and study to learn a new language. Why? Because if they could speak a foreign language supernaturally, they could just go right to the field. But all Pentecostals, all charismatic missionaries, guess what they do when they go to the mission field? Just like us, they go to language school. In Acts chapter 2, uh, they spoke a foreign language they did not know by the miracle power of God. That gift has ceased. Paul then visits Ephesus, and then Macedonia, 1 Timothy 1, 3. He says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia. Paul visited Troas. You say, how do you know? Because he forgot his coat. You ever had that problem? I know you do, because I see in the coat racks, you leave your coats. My problem is I leave the umbrella. Now, raining when you leave, so why do you need an umbrella? Uh, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. So Paul left his cloak at Troas. Timothy, bring it to me. Maybe he left it because he didn't forget it. Maybe somebody was cold, and he needed to loan it to them, and now he wants it back because he's in a dungeon, and he needs it. Paul visited Nicopolis. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis. For I have determined there to winter. So we know he was there. He sent Titus to Dalmatia, 2 Timothy 4.10. Uh, uh, Dalmatia, where the Dalmatian puppies come from. Uh, you thought it was uh, 101 Dalmatians. No, it's, it's there. Uh, just uh, on the coast there of the Adriatic Sea to the right. Uh, uh, that is modern Croatia, northern Albania. Did he visit Spain? I can tell you absolutely for sure, maybe. <laughs> maybe he visited Spain. Uh, he said, he said, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, Romans 15, verse 24, and verse 28. Uh, he really wanted to go to Spain. When he wrote 2 Timothy, he said, I finished my course. I'm prepared to go to heaven. It sounds like a man who, who, who accomplished his goals. So I would think he probably made it to Spain. Uh, not shown here in this map, but it kind of gives you a picture. Some call it Paul's fourth missionary journey. Then Paul experienced persecution as he is imprisoned in Rome a second time. Emperor Nero began a horrific persecution in 67 AD, and that led to the death of Peter and the death of Paul, 2 Timothy 4. My message today is entitled, Are You Willing to Live for Christ? no matter what the cost. Would you please stand with me as I read from Matthew chapter 5 what Jesus said about persecution on the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed 
are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. May we pray. Thank you for this time to come into your word. We ask that you might speak to our hearts about how we're living our lives and if we're living our lives for Christ. And I pray that if, if we have ignored you, forgotten you, become apathetic towards your will, today I pray that we will be challenged and inspired to live for Christ no matter what the cost. I pray if there be some here today that, that they're just not sure if heaven is their home, may the Spirit of God convict them, draw them, and may they make the commitment to be born again into your family today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You know, as Christians, for the most part, according to, to statistics and surveys, as Christians, we live happier lives, we live healthier lives, we live longer lives than non-Christians. Our marriages are stronger, our friendships are deeper, we have a peace and a joy from the Lord that words can't even describe. Our sins are forgiven. The shame and guilt of our past is gone. We live with a clear conscience. It's wonderful to be a Christian. But there's another side of our Christian life that we don't like to talk about. Persecution. Our hearts ache when we hear of Christians who are suffering greatly in other countries. And by comparison, any, any of the persecution that we experience here in America is so very small by way of comparison. We are called all kinds of, of names, and, and that's mainly what's happening to this day. Uh, some are struggling with job uh, issues as well. Three weeks ago in the media... The media blamed those who hold to biblical family values as the cause of a shooting at a nightclub in Colorado. It turns out that the shooter had nothing to do with biblical family values. The shooter is one of those people who is so confused about how to identify themselves. Focus on the family was then vandalized on Thanksgiving Day. Of course, they had nothing to do with the shooter and the shooting. In 2022, over 360 million Christians live with high levels in countries with high levels of persecution and discrimination. 5,898 Christians were killed for their faith this year. Some say that's a low estimate and it should be over 10,000. 5,110 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked, including uh, pro-life family clinics. 4,765 Christians were imprisoned without trial or arrest. 3,829 is the number of Christians abducted for their faith. Many claim there's more persecution today, and that may be true because there are more Christians to persecute. Some here today, right now, right now, in our congregation, early service in this service, have family and friends in other countries that are going through extremely difficult times of persecution. Those who live in the Middle East, those who live in China, India, and Africa. So what did Jesus teach about persecution? We find it here in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus predicted his followers would be persecuted. Uh, don't you love the Beatitudes? Don't you love all those blesseds? Blessed, what does blessed mean? It means happy. And Jesus, he said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, uh, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Do you know what comes next? Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus predicted in John chapter 15, verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also, what? Persecute you. What did Jesus teach about persecution? He predicted it would happen. Secondly, Jesus promised great reward for the persecuted. Uh, those who suffer persecution will share great reward in heaven, just like the Old Testament prophets. Look with me at verses 11 and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice! And be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Luke 6, 23, Jesus kind of, of uh, takes it up a notch, and he says this. He says, Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. You know, the disciples who heard this they became apostles. They took this literally. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, we find that they are arrested. We find that they are beaten. We find they are commanded, do not preach in this man's name again. What did they say? Should we obey God or you? We choose to obey God. And they left from that place, leaping for joy, giving high fives. We got to suffer for Jesus. Think about it. Jesus said, if you suffer for me, great is your reward in heaven. The, the persecutors think they're hurting the Christians when in truth they're giving to their account greater reward in heaven. So they're accomplishing the exact opposite of what they're trying to do. So Jesus promised great reward. Uh, let her see, Jesus' presence is with the persecuted. He said, I'm with you always even unto the end of the world. I'll never leave you. You can feel my presence. I will be with you. When we experience persecution, he promises to give us strength. 2 Corinthians 2.10, he said, when I am weak, then I'm strong. When we run out of our own strength, then we can feel God's strength that will be with us. In your notes, Isaiah 43.2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Jesus says we will be blessed because our reward is in heaven. It will be great because we share in the ministry with the prophets. So what did Jesus teach us about persecution? He said you need to expect it. What did he teach us? He says do not fear it. He says I want you to know it's temporary compared to heaven. Heaven is eternal. And then he said God will manifest his presence to us. Look for it. Receive courage from others who have been through persecution, and we're going to experience that today. Yea, all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. So during the first 300 years of Christianity, the first persecution, of course, began there in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Saul of Tarsus led that persecution, and they spread everywhere, sharing the gospel. But there were 10 major persecutions across the Roman Empire. Why did the Roman Empire persecute Christians and Jews? Because we worship one God. And the Roman, the pagan Roman uh, people, they worshiped many gods, and many gods included the emperor himself, emperor worship. So Nero brought the first great persecution in 67 AD. He blamed the Christians for the fire of Rome. If you recall, the fire was in 64 AD. It happened to be in an area. Nero then confiscated that area. He was going to build a, 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 just a, a palatial palace for himself and pond and lake there. And, and then the people kind of turned against him. So he, he accused the Christians horrific persecutions. I won't describe them to you today. You can read about them, and it'll turn your stomach. And then that didn't work, and so he actually took his own life. 
And the next ruler, Domitian, came and he took that same area. I showed it to you. He took that same area where Nero was going to build his palace, and that's where the Roman Colosseum is built. Same area. And he used Jewish money, uh, he used Jewish slaves to be able to build that massive Colosseum that's still with us today. First persecution ordered by the Romans. The seventh persecution was ordered by Emperor Decius in 250 AD. It is the first empire-wide persecution. And tens of thousands of Christians died. The edict spread all the way to the island of Crete. Crete, that place where Paul left Titus. If Christians would just make a sacrifice to the emperor, they were given a piece of paper. And the piece of paper was a certificate of sacrifice. And you would be cleared of suspicion. 200 years earlier, when Paul left Titus on Crete, he had a lot of work to do. The Christians on Crete were baby Christians, new Christians. They were struggling with selfishness. They were struggling with worldliness. They were struggling with false teaching. In fact, Paul writes Titus in chapter 1, and he quotes one of their own poets who says, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bell with slow bellies, Titus 1, 12. How would you like your national poet to describe your country that way? Oh, yeah, he's talking about his own people. Yeah, you're a bunch of liars, a bunch of evil beasts with slow bellies. And, and these are the kind of people that, that Titus is supposed to go from church to church, train some guys, ordain pastors, and they're supposed to build up these Christians. And they did. Because I want you to know that 200 years later, there are a lot of churches and there are some strong Christians and pastors. They passed on the faith to the generations to come. 200 years later, when the governor of Crete carried out the decree of Decius, 10 faithful pastors refused to bow to the idol. The governor ordered them to be cruelly tortured for 30 days. After 30 days of torture, they were all given a second chance to recant their faith in Christ. <laughs> Not one turned their back on Christ. The governor ordered them to be headed. This is the Roman theater, the Odeon. This is the place where these ten pastors stood after 30 days of torture, and they were beheaded and they were martyred. Their blood was shed right here. Holy ground. What I see here is the emperor ordered everyone to worship him in the empire once a year. A shrine was set up. A great celebration was declared to worship him. The ten pastors refused to bow. You know, it's a scene right out of Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, when the music played, there's this massive image of Nebuchadnezzar, a big gold statue. Everybody's down kissing the dirt with these three guys, three young Jewish men. And they brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, I'm going to give you guys a second chance. So when the music plays, you just bow, and you can live. And if you don't bow, you're going to die. I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And the three Jewish men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, you can give us 100 chances. We're not bowing. And our God is so great, he can deliver us out of the fire. But if not, we're going to worship God alone. And you know the end of the story, they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and there was a fourth individual, like unto the Son of God, who protected them. That same scene is happening right here. They said, we will not bow. Here are three pastors that were on our trip. Pastor Chapel. Pastor Brett from North Carolina and myself. And we all begin to wonder what would we three pastors do if we were alive in 250 AD standing in that Roman Colosseum? And I trust that we could say, along with you, that if we were called upon to die for Christ, that we would say, Yes, I'm willing to die for Christ. But I think it's that 30 days of torture that I don't think I would do so well with. How about you? You see, they didn't know 
They didn't know if they, if they refused that if they were going to have another 30 days of torture or 60 or 90 days of torture. They didn't know. But they said, we will not bow. We will not sacrifice to the emperor or a false god. We would rather die. Do you know 17 centuries have come and gone? Hundreds of thousands of people have been born and lived and died on Crete. Other than Titus, Paul's son of the faith, there's a church name for him, and you see it here, the church of St. Titus. Other than Titus, no name is more honored today than those 10 pastors. And I think it is good for me to read their names to you today. They're in your notes. Theodulus, Saturninus, Eporus, Galatius, Eunician, Zadikus, Pompeius, Agathapos, Basilides, and Everstus. If you are a Christian, one day you're going to meet these ten men and their wives in heaven. And you're going to say, my pastor told me about your heroic story. Thank you. But I don't think he pronounced your names exactly the right way. <laughs> That's okay. At least I got the spelling right. Jesus predicted persecution. But do you ever wonder why it happens? These men... These men, and by the way, their graves have been found. Archaeologists have found their graves. And they have a shrine for it, a memorial for it. And God gave them the grace to endure the 30 days of torture and martyrdom. So why? Why does it happen? On page four of your notes, you see why people persecute Christians. First of all, there's a spiritual component. They are motivated by the demonic host. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walked about seeking whom he may devour. There's a spiritual war going on in the world today between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, between God and between Satan. It makes no sense when you think about the slaughter that has happened over the last 20 centuries. You can't ignore the fact that there is a spiritual battle going on. Satan wants to stop Christianity, but every, it's like taking a tomato and you smash it. What happens is it squirts everywhere, and it was uh, one of the early church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is what? The seed of the church. It did not stop Christianity. A second reason is they mistakenly think that they're serving God. Saul of Tarsus was, was this way. Before he became the Apostle Paul, he thought he was serving God by arresting and killing Christians. He said that, 1 Timothy 1.13. He said, I was before a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was injurious to the Christians. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. A third reason there is persecution they know they are guilty. They have a guilty conscience. And so they lash out at others to feel better about themselves. Isn't this true of most bullies? They feel insecure about themselves and the things that they have done. And so somehow they feel justified by lashing out to others. It's back to that. They got the big mo uh, beam in their own eye and they're picking on the toothpick in someone else's eye. So as Christians, how do we respond to persecution? First of all, we are to pray for those who persecute us for our Christian faith. Jesus said very specifically, love your enemies, bless them which curse you and do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Notice how Jesus is very specific. He says, I want you to, I want you to pray for them, I want you to love them, I want to you to bless them with your words. They curse at you. You're not to curse back. I want you to pray for their salvation. And but by the grace of God, we might be on the other side ourselves. Follow the example of the Lord Jesus. When he was on the cross, being persecuted, being cursed, being spit at, dying, beaten, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Follow his example. How do we respond to persecution? 
Pray for those who persecute you. Secondly, be bold and not fearful. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, and much more bold to speak the word without fear. Because Paul is in prison. This is the first imprisonment when he wrote Philippians. He said, I want you to know that I'm, I'm sharing my faith with the guards, and they're getting saved. I'm sharing my faith with those of Caesar's household, and they're getting saved. And Paul says, because I'm sharing my faith in prison, people outside of prison are getting more bold to share their faith. I'd like to share a video of a man we will call Ahmed. And like Saul of Tarsus, he once persecuted Christianity and Christ and Christians. But then he met the Lord. Watch with me. I was a very fanatic follower of Islam. I spent much of my time at the mosque speaking against Christianity. Ahmed is not his real name, and this is not his face. He's from a Middle Eastern country that we will not name. Ahmed is one of the Christians who attended spiritual leadership conference in Egypt in the summer of 2022. While he was there, he met with Pastor Chapel and told him his story. It has been a joy to meet uh, the pastors from Syria, uh, from Ethiopia, various parts of Africa, people that are really serving God in difficult places. But Pastor Malin, uh, no story has gripped our hearts like the brother that's with us today. And we're going to withhold his name, and you'll understand why in a moment. And uh, brother, thank you for coming and for being with us. Uh, brother, how did you come to know Christ as your Savior? One day, as I was exiting the mosque, two German men came up to me and shook my hand. They introduced themselves and told me that they were businessmen visiting my province. And they told me they were Christians. Now I was defiled. I cleansed my hands and went to argue with them, to try to convince them to follow Muhammad. We talked together and one of them asked me three questions about Islam. They were questions I could not answer. Those questions shook me. I felt there was something missing in my heart. I prayed and fasted, but there is still something missing. Determined to shake the faith of these Christian German businessmen, Ahmed asked for a Bible so he could write down questions he had about their faith. For one week, I read the Bible, hours every day. And I wrote down 128 questions for them. So I called them and I said, hey, come over. I want to argue with you. I have questions for you. The German Christians came and patiently answered Ahmed's questions. They answered all 128 questions. After answering one of the questions, he asked me to pray. So we prayed together. He put his hand on my back and I started crying because he was praying for me and I was his enemy. Ahmed called them to come back and they did, several days in a row. After spending a few evenings talking with them, I surrendered my life to Jesus and started to serve the Lord. I started witnessing and bringing souls to Christ. Someone who Ahmed had witnessed to turned him into the authorities. Security forces arrested Ahmed, threw his wife and children into the streets, and took Ahmed to a detention facility. They began to interrogate me. They said, give us the names of those who are Christians like you. It was very difficult. I could not mention any of the names, because if I give one name and his faith is weak, he will speak about all the others, so I didn't say a word. To punish him for witnessing and for not cooperating, Ahmed faced intense torture. They would tie my hands and raise me to the ceiling and leave me for hours. My hands would turn black. They would torture me with electricity, with beatings. They would tie my feet and whip them so I could not walk. At one point, Ahmed was transferred to a room with 14 other prisoners. He began witnessing to these men and writing small portions of scripture for them. However, one of them reported him. They took me to another part of the prison. 
a room where they were holding about 20 members of ISIS. The guard brought me in and told them this man is a Christian and he was converting Muslims to Christianity. They took a blanket and covered me and started beating me. I was screaming and shouting until I could not breathe. They carried his unconscious body to a solitary cell, where guards assumed he would die from his injuries. My teeth were broken. I cannot hear from my right ear. My whole body was swollen. I prayed that God would let me leave this place. Weeks later in the spring of 2020, still seriously injured, Ahmed was released from prison. He fled to a different province with his wife and children. For his faith in Christ, Ahmed lost his printing business and was disowned and denied by his father. He began listening to podcasts from a Baptist missionary serving in Lebanon, who began to disciple him and help him with his medical and living expenses. We in America have a lot of freedom. So we um, have freedom to worship. But sometimes the Christians in America don't use their freedom to witness. Because they become embarrassed or lazy. Are you sure they are Christians? At the conference, Video. The video was cut early there. At the conference, they offered him to be able to go to Egypt. And he said, I have to go back to my homeland. I have to go back to share the gospel with those without Christ. I need to go back pulling them out of the fire. They're on the road to hell. He asked the question, of the Americans in response to Christians in America do not witness. They're fearful, they're embarrassed. And his question was, are you sure they are Christians? Ancient meets modern. As Christians, how do we respond to persecution? We, we pray for those who persecute us. We're to be bold and not fearful. And then we're to ask God to help us to stay faithful. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. James 1.12. Though persecuted himself, Ahmad is bold in the Lord. He's not fearful to return to his homeland to share Christ with others, even though he might be arrested again. You see, there is something more important than political freedom and safety, and that is spiritual freedom in Christ. And that is what his countrymen need. And so he has returned. If living out your faith is not costing you something, then maybe you're not doing it the right way. There in your notes, are you living, are you willing to live for Christ no matter what the cost? Today, no one here today is going to die for their faith. Today, no one here today is going to be arrested for your faith. Are you willing to live for Christ no matter what the cost? Are you willing to do the basics? To be in the Word of God every day, to be in church every Sunday, to be in prayer, to be giving, to be witnessing, to be faithful, to be loyal to Christ and loyal to church and loyal to your Christian friends. If you only practice your faith and obedience when it's convenient, your faith may be weak. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, turn to Him today. There in your notes, are you willing to lose your life to save it? May we be inspired by those who are persecuted and are faithful. May we pray. Father, thank you for our time to be in your house. Thank you for those faithful in the first century. Thank you for those faithful in the 21st century, regardless of the cost to follow Christ. 
And now, Father, I pray that each one of us would examine our hearts to see, are we willing to live for Christ no matter what the cost? Our heads are bowed as we come into God's presence. I want to ask you today, do you know for certain that you're saved? Was there a time in your life that you became born again, that you gave your life to Christ. You said, I need to be saved. I need to be born again. I need to trust Christ. Do, do you have a moment in time that you remember a conscious commitment to choose to follow Christ, to be saved? If you're not ashamed to be called a follower of Christ, would you simply raise your hand all over our congregation today? God bless you. Thank you. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I, I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved. I believe the Bible. At least in my head, I, I, I know I've prayed before. I try and keep the Ten Commandments. I try and be good. I try and love my family and do right. I've done the sacraments. I come to church. I'm at church today or watching online. But in my heart, I'm not sure that I've been born again. I need to transfer my faith from my head to my heart. I want to trust Christ today. If I'm speaking to you this morning, may I ask you this question? Is there one reason why you would not want to choose Christ today? The Bible says the day you hear this good news is the day you are to respond. Today is your day of salvation. You ask, Pastor, how do I do that? The Bible's very clear. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. What do I pray? From your heart you believe that Jesus died for you and that he rose again. That you understand you cannot enter heaven with your sin. You must be forgiven. If you sense that tug in your heart today, would you say yes to Christ? Would you pray with me now right where you're seated, maybe online watching today? From your heart, it must be sincere. It must be earnest. God hears the prayer of your heart. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for me and rose again. Today I receive him into my heart and life as my Lord and Savior. Please save me today. Our heads are bowed as we show respect to our neighbor. I simply want to ask you today, if you prayed with me and meant it, I say welcome to God's family. I'd like to pray for you to have this assurance that Paul and Titus many of us here today have that heaven's our home. I want to pray for you today. I'll not call you out. I'll not embarrass you in any way. But you'd say, Pastor, I just prayed with you from my heart and I meant it. And I'm not ashamed now to be called a true Christian. Would you simply raise your hand? Anybody in this congregation, I pray with you today. Just simply lift your hand for a moment. I'd like to pray for you. Anyone at all, I've trusted Christ as my Savior today. Christian during this time of invitation hymn, would you do business with God? Would you say to the Lord, yes, Lord, I, I do want to live for Christ no matter what the cost. Whatever you call me to do, I'm willing to do. Help me to start with the basics in the Word, in church, faithfully sharing, forgiving, serving, giving, loving. Come and see May you be inspired by those who have gone before us.
grateful for your blessings. We're grateful for prosperity and peace. We're grateful for our country and all that we have. And yet I pray, God, that out of our gratitude that when persecution comes, we will stand strong, stand true, boldly sharing Christ without fear. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God is so good to us, isn't he? Let's pray.